Hi folks, Canadian Prepper here. So in a follow-up to our recent videos, Dr. Arthur T. Bradley has returned. He's a NASA engineer and he's going to answer all of your questions about electromagnetic pulse and how you can prepare for it. So let's get to it. So we have uh, a lot of questions here from subscribers from our last video that we did. Now, if you guys are not familiar with what EMP is and the basics of that, I encourage you to go and check out uh, Dr. Arthur T. Bradley's channel. And uh, you can check out the first video that we did because we provide a good synopsis of what it is. Maybe you could just briefly tell people what it is we're talking about and then explain how they can protect against it because you have a new device that's on the market, which is pretty innovative. And uh, I'm hoping to get one in my hand soon to test it out. Uh, maybe you could talk a bit about that. Sure. Yeah. So an EMP in general, when we say EMP, we're talking about a nuclear EMP, which is just the detonation of a nuclear warhead very high in the atmosphere. So think like, you know, 100 to 300 miles up in the atmosphere where you detonate a warhead doesn't cause any property damage on the ground. Most people probably wouldn't even know it happened, um, but it does. And we won't get into the physics, but it ultimately results in very powerful electromagnetic waves striking the surface of the Earth as well as some currents flowing along very long conductors that are down at the Earth's surface. And both of those cause problems. The, the powerful waves that come down are very high frequency, and it can damage things like cell phones and radios and any, any kind of small electronic devices that has modern technology, vehicles. Um, the, the energy that's coupled into those long conductors, the currents that are coupled into those, end up taking out things like the electrical power grids, where you end up overloading transformers, for example. And so what happens is you destroy infrastructures, just the electrical grid, maybe telecommunications industries, and everything else falls after that, um, as well as a lot of very small scale electronics that can affect everyone. And we can have all kinds of disruptions because of that damage. So it's a very asymmetric attack, like you mentioned earlier. Nobody at the ground really sees I've been attacked. They just, things just don't work properly anymore. Maybe there's a few things that end up zapping and get, you know, obviously are damaged but they don't feel like they've just been bombed, right? People aren't lying dead in the street. And so it's asymmetric in the fact that most people won't think, oh, well, we've just had this huge attack and it has a huge influence on us. They'll just think it's a small scale impact around them. They won't really understand the scope of it. And so, like you said, maybe they wouldn't support a widespread retaliation because they wouldn't really understand the scope of that damage. Now, ask them three months later if they still didn't have electricity and they might would have wanted to launch those weapons, but... Um, so that's what it is, though. It's an ability to, to essentially destroy a lot of infrastructure and a lot of electronics with a nuclear detonation high in the atmosphere. Now, you have this device that protects against it or might alert us if there's an EMP that happens, because that's the problem with an EMP is you're not going to smell it. You're probably you yeah. might hear it uh, if you're close enough. But uh, talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So I've talked a lot over the years about trying to protect personal property from an EMP and like your car, your home your personal electronics, when people, everybody knows about Faraday cages and those kinds of things, uh, surge protection devices, all very useful. Um, none, of them, none of them are perfect solutions. And EMP is a very broad type uh, threat to you. So it's difficult to protect from. But one thing we didn't really have was a way of even like detecting that something might've just happened, right? If you're on the ground and you're several hundred miles from where the detonation is, you're not gonna know that it happened. And, and all you might know is that my computer's not working well, very well right now. Oh, things in my house now are starting to have problems. So it would be nice to have some kind of early warning system. So I, I invented a small plug-in device. I, I, brought a, I brought a unit here with me. This is, a, I don't know if we can see it. This is with the lid opened up. It's just a small device that plugs into the wall. And it's not terribly complicated. It's a little bit complicated. But, and what it does is it looks for radiated electromagnetic energy, that, that energy we talked about that would come from an EMP, or the power line level starting to either rise or fall due to that coupled energy from an EMP. So it looks for both of them. And if it finds either one of them, it sounds an alarm and says, hey, something is, is not right here. It has different alarms to tell you, is it a radiated thing or is it a conducted thing? And it gives you an opportunity. Now, it doesn't change the fact that you may have electronics damage, but it gives you a couple of things. It gives you the ability to hurry out and open the breaker on your, on your house or your business. Now, why does that matter? Well, it won't, it won't help you from the E1, E2, the early fast pulse that comes in, but it might help you against that slow growing surge that might occur on the power lines. And so if you open the breaker from that, you can prevent that energy from driving into your home and maybe causing a fire or damaging your electronics. 
So it gives you the ability to disconnect from the grid early before the voltages have gotten way too high. And the other thing it does is it gives you some indication that not only did I just have an electronics failure, we might've just experienced something very serious. Do I have a protocol I should follow? Like, do I need to let my friends know I just detected something really weird going on? Are you noticing something there? Should we evacuate? Should we do something different than being uh, oblivious to it for perhaps several hours? By then, it may be a little too late to take some of those actions. So it's an early warning device. This is something that plugs into the wall. So uh, one of my things is that if you weren't there at the time to hear the alarm, uh, is there something on the device that would notify you that something had happened? Because yeah. I, I guess uh, one of the you know questions would be, okay, there was a power outage. You came home and you know maybe you missed the alarm, but you still want to know if it was an EMP or if it was something else that's going on. Sure. Is there a way yeah. that it would uh, kind of have like a... Uh, what are the things that play like a black box, so to speak? Of- yeah, it's such a thing as possible, but we didn't build it into this first unit because once the grid comes down, the power to the unit is lost, right? So you'd have to store it in some memory, put some backup power on it, interrogate it, find out what the event was. It's all very possible to do that. It just makes it a lot more complicated. Mm-hmm. Um, it might happen in later. Like, for example, another option is the unit could trigger a transfer switch, which disconnects your power automatically from the house. That's a really nice product. Yeah. Um, and we may add that later as a feature, but right now it, it makes it really complex to develop, you know, multi, you can transfer multiple different transfer switches and there's a lot of complexity to that. This particular unit is an all analog electronics. There's no digital electronics in it, no computers that are going to get zapped. It's got hardened electronics in it to try and suppress transients to keep it from being damaged. So it's, it's, you're right. If you're away from home and it went off while you were gone, well, whatever damage was going to happen has already happened anyway. So I'm not, I mean, the only thing it would give you is that early warning we said is that maybe I should check with my friends and see if we're all suffering the same problems. Um, But it's really meant more for a, hey, I'm here, it's in my house or my garage or wherever these places are. And it has just told me something just happened and I need to move quickly. I need to do something very quickly. It sounds like an interesting concept and I'm sure it could be wired in somehow to other other devices, uh, like whether that's... uh, if you have some sort of security system, like a ring camera or something where it could have re- recorded the sound or, or, you know, I'm sure there's ways that you could uh, have it so that you could use it remotely. Cause I guess one of my concerns would be, let's say I'm on the road at the time I have my cell phone, the alarm's going off at home. I don't hear it. It would be neat if it could somehow send me a message or if I could be notified mm-hmm. somehow. And I think you could, you know, Jerry rig something like that together with using other types of technology, even though I guess the the assumption would be that, of course, your power would be shut off, maybe if it was a severe enough EMP, or if you were close enough to it. I I think there's definitely, you know, a lot of ways that, that, uh, you know, this in future iterations, it could be very useful, not just for EMP, but even like you said, as a whole home surge protector of sorts. Yeah, it could be built into, we talk, we've talked about this, some building it into a whole home surge protection device that maybe even not only has the ability to warn you, but also has the ability to disconnect the home automatically. And that would be like the ultimate holy grail to me is if you had something that told you what just happened and it was able to disconnect you um, and protect you from the incoming E1, E2 type poles. Yeah, all that would be very helpful. I think that's probably down the road a few years. It takes a while to develop and get all those products certified like that. Um, but there are also, we've talked about, um, you talked about being on the road. We've talked about making a, uh, like a little key fob version of this that would go on your keychain. Um, they have, for example, detectors now that will detect uh, radiation levels that are like that. You guys may know of those probably. I have one, a nuke alert is what they were called. And they would sound a little sound if they got radiation too high. And the same idea could be done for this where wherever you're at, you could have one close enough by that it would give you some kind of warning. Yeah, I think that's an excellent idea. I look forward to getting one and, and testing one out. You have a cool device that allows you to like uh, create little mini EMPs and, and test out the effects of that. Yeah, I've got a little, well, so generating a true EMP with like 50 KV per meter, you know, real powerful EMP requires a whole facility and lots of certifications. I don't have that. I'd have to pay someone to do that. Um, but, but we do, at least in my video, we do a little mini demonstration with just a little cheap handheld pulse generator. And it's not a perfect EMP by any stretch, but it does generate an electromagnetic pulse. 
And we just use that to demonstrate that the device will detect that radiated energy and it will sound. And we can do the same thing on a power line. We can generate an impulse and get the, and the system to sound. It's just meant for demonstrations, but it is a pretty neat demonstration to do. Yeah, I got to get me one of those because I'd love to yeah, we'll get you one. out and, and, and hopefully uh, get me one of those EMP generators, I mean. Yeah, I know what you want. You want to break something. Exactly. Yeah, you know me. Uh, that's my all-American prepper coming out, I guess. Okay, so we got a question here from Elizabeth Coward. I must know, will the altitude of region impact an EMP? I think what she's saying here is, for example, what, if any difference, would there be in the effect of electronics on uh, mountain ranges versus coast, say? So will altitude yeah. affect or attenuate the effect of an electromagnetic pulse? Yeah, so, and it's a complicated question to answer because there are many factors that affect the kind of field levels you'd see. Certainly geographic factors, like if you're behind a mountain or something like that, whether you're in the line of sight of the blast, um, toward the coast, typically near bodies of water, the, the energy is greater. You end up with more uh, field levels there. So the short answer is yes, it would affect it. But the longer answer is it's really complicated to predict. Um, so I couldn't say, oh, it's going to be worse if you're atop the mountain than if you're down near the coast. Um, it's a very complex pattern that gets generated and it's, it's affected by geography. And you say that it's more damaging if you're closer to sea level. Yeah, I've seen some studies before that um, right up near the water, and I don't know exactly why that is from a physics perspective, that they saw you know, additional damage from the fields and so forth. So you know, it has to do with our magnetic field lines, and it has to do with the reflections of the energy. And there's, like I said, it's a very complex problem to, to know. And that's uh, even scarier considering that's where most of the major cities are located. Yeah, true. So that's uh, not good. So Florida Prepper asks, are power grid or water supplies are the most sensitive? Others um, have actually proven this. My question for the doctor is, what does he consider the most critical of our infrastructure for our enemies to cripple? I'm assuming using an EMP. And uh, how can we shield ourselves from this problem? Well, you already answered that part. But yeah. Um, what is the most critical of the infrastructure, you think? Yeah, electrical infrastructure for sure is the most critical. Our power grid, uh, if you can take that out, everything else is dependent on it, right? Communications and banking and government. And you go on down the list, emergency services, everybody's dependent on electricity. So if you can take out the grid, even a good portion of the grid, you can really cripple the country. And so how do we protect it? Well, we need it at a national level for you know, there to be an impetus to go in and harden these infrastructures. Um, I, I know some, you, some areas are looking at that. I don't know how much progress they've made. And I don't even know how effective they are because it's not like we can easily test, you know, oh, we're gonna generate an EMP and see what happens. You know? So a lot of it's done through analysis, um, but I do think the, the nation as a whole would be well served to take a good hard look at the effects of an EMP on our electrical grid. Yeah, it's definitely something that's bound to happen at some point as technology advances. And, you know, on the topic of critical infrastructure, I mean, even just the internet itself, you know, if, if somehow through a massive cyber attack, like denial of service, uh, and people weren't able to use the internet, I mean, just thinking about how many, how much of our life is wired into the internet right now, even just that. And of course, the power grid is many levels underneath the pyramid in terms of our hierarchy of needs. So uh, yeah, I mean, if the power grid was taken out, I think there's, there's more things that will be gone than people have even realized at this point. Uh, so Andre Favron says, if a transformer is destroyed due to an EMP event, and if people don't know, a transformer is uh, basically one of the main uh, cruxes or nexuses of uh, a power system to distribute power. And there's uh, probably several thousand of these across North America, very expensive, very big. And does the entire transformer have to be rebuilt or are there just components that would have to be rebuilt and would that expedite the repair process? Yeah. So I think she's talking about those large transformers that you're, you mentioned, the building size transformers that everybody's so worried about. I mean, there are millions of transformers around, the ones up on the poles, the big round things. And yeah. transformers just convert from one voltage to another voltage. They, they have inter, intercoupled windings. Um, and we would certainly destroy a bunch of transformers, small ones and big ones, if an EMP occurred. 
And I don't know, the small ones probably would just be, you would end up being damaged, the coils would burn and you wouldn't end up being able to repair them very easily. The larger ones are so big and complex. I, I got I to imagine that they don't just throw those things away and roll in another one. Um, they probably are repaired in some way. But my understanding is that, that that would take a long time to get them repaired and replaced. And that's the big worry is that if you took out enough of those large transformers, you can't bring back up the grid without them. And if it took you months to get them replaced or repaired, um, you know, you're in a you're in a real situation where people might be without electricity for several months. And that that hardship is not something we would have experienced before. I think it'd be very difficult on us. And it just got me thinking about if there was such an event that happened. I wonder which transformers they would prioritize as being, you know, ones we need to fix first, because obviously ones are in and around government buildings. And, you know, so there were there would be a a bit of a protocol that they would follow in terms of fixing them. Not all will be created equal. And that could create a lot of civil unrest unto itself from people wondering, Hey, why aren't you fixing our transformer? Right? So I'm not sure who this one is from, but he asked, he or she asks, other than Faraday cages, what building materials, if any, can act as EMP protection, steel reinforced concrete structures, perhaps with steel doors above and below ground, does soil itself protect at all? And is material thickness and layers of materials important? Yeah, a lot of folks have looked at this over the years. NIST has a paper out that you can get for free on the internet about shielding effectiveness of um, construction materials, for example. And what they looked at is, you know, like, let's say you have reinforced concrete versus brick versus, you know, sheetrock, right? And, And they have a whole, they did a big bunch of studies, very professionally done. And it looks like if you had eight inches of reinforced concrete, in other words, you built a, a building out of it, you might get about 30 dB of shielding, which is pretty good. Um, 30 dB of shielding at the high frequencies. Now, lower frequencies, you wouldn't get as much shielding. But again, the higher the frequency, the easier it is to couple on small scale electronics. So even though low frequencies might get through it easier, they wouldn't couple very well into things. And so they probably wouldn't cause as much damage. It's really things that are like 100 megahertz to a gigahertz. That energy is pretty efficient at getting into electronics and causing lots of problems. And so you might get about 30 dB of shielding against that kind of stuff from reinforced concrete. And it just goes down from there. That's about the best you get. If you had concrete blocks, maybe you get 10 dB. Bricks maybe give you a few, three or four dB, a single layer brick. And sheetrock gives you less than a dB of shielding. So you do get some, but, you know, and yes, you can add them. You could put a brick layer in something else and add them up. Um, ideally, you want to have conductive materials to give you the best shielding, like metals, right? They give you great shielding, even at very thin metals. Um, but things that are not metals, like concrete and others, they do give you some shielding for sure. Uh, as for natural things, you mentioned that about soil and water. Um, so soil is a huge variation, depending on if you're talking about, you know, farmland where you have this moist, you know, natural earthy soil, that's pretty good at shielding. You might have to only get about 10 feet down to get really good shielding. But if you're in maybe the arid desert, you know, you might have to get, you know, hundred feet down to get the same level of shielding. And so the level of moisture and the density of the soil has a lot to do with what kind of shielding you get. Um, water is a very good, uh, suppressor of RF energy, um, it's anybody knows it's worked on submarines and things. You can't transmit RF energy into water very efficiently. So if you can get even like maybe 10 feet of water, something like that, you can get a lot of suppression of RF energy. It's the practicality of storing items. Like I, and people are asking, like, can I, can I protect something by putting it in the bottom of my swimming pool? Well, yeah, you can get some protection from doing that, but there's probably a better way than the risk of dunking all your electronics down in the bottom of your pool. Um, You know, you can build a Faraday cage or something like that. So now if you have a natural retreat that's down in the cave somewhere or something, yeah, you'll get all kinds of shielding there. Um, And and that one's a freebie. So why not take advantage of it? Well, I think we would all be cavemen sooner or later after uh, that sort of event happens. So I guess it'd be getting a head start on things. So Craig Simmons says, hi, guys. How long after an EMP attack is it safe? to take your electronic equipment out of protective cases. So can, does it have to stay in there for a while or should, you know, take it out right away? Yeah. So an EMP basically has three different phases. It has an E1 phase, which is the early phase. And that occurs in nanoseconds, about 10, 15 nanoseconds. And then there's an E2 phase, which occurs in microseconds now. So that means those are way over before you've even blinked your eye. Right. And so 
you're not going to do anything about opening up your bag before those have occurred. E3 is that one that couples all that sort of much slower energy that builds up on the power lines and causes lots of problems for us. And that can take minutes to even hours. And so here's what I would say. If you store personal electronics, if you think an EMP happened and you don't think another EMP is about to happen, like they're going to double hit you, you could take it out of the bag and have no worry that the EMP is going to damage it because that the part that could damage it's already over. Um, just don't plug it into the wall, like immediately take it out and go plug it in the wall because the, that power may still have issues with the E3 coming in. So that's sort of the short answer of it. And how long does that E3 pulse last? Could be hours. It could last hours. Yeah. yeah. It's a much, much lower frequency content. And so it won't couple into small freestanding electronics. It's just way too low frequency, but it does couple very efficiently through induction into these long conductors. And then you build up these currents that flow through these long conductors. And that's what overloads transformers and blows out your, your utilities and stuff like that. And you don't, you know, ideally, I mean, you're almost better off if the transformer outside your house blows up early because then at least maybe your house didn't get hit with, you know, over voltages and things. And you could hook up your generator or your solar to it and maybe be up and going. But there's no guarantee that's what's going to happen. You're that, that uh, transform may be really, you know, rock solid and he may stay until he gets to 500 volts on the line. And by 500 volts, you've already taken all kinds of stuff out in your house. And so that's the idea of opening the breaker if you know something's occurring. Okay, so Reality Check asks, if a warhead is detonated in space, how much shrapnel does that generate and how many other satellites might it take out unintentionally? I'm assuming if well, an EMP weapon with the yeah. satellites also. Yeah, I think I think I don't think that's such a big concern. I mean, yes, you're going to generate debris and that debris is going to be out there and there'll be some number of pieces of debris. Um, it's worse when they hit something intentionally, like Russia did, you know, where they hit their own satellite. I think it created 4,000 trackable de- debris particles or something. Um, it's, but I don't think the warhead itself would be, the debris would be the worry. I think it would be the effect of that warhead, which could damage satellites and stuff, of course. Um, not just the debris, but the actual electromagnetic energy could damage satellites. So I think it would be those more direct effects that were more worrisome than the debris from that. Okay. Makes sense. Another question here. Uh, will a CME affect only the hemisphere of the Earth? I think they mean the side of the Earth, which is facing the sun. Yeah, pretty much. Um, I think there's some wrapping kind of effect that occurs as things are interconnected, but it is, it is something that affects the primary side that's facing where the CME hits. Um, and so when we've seen that before where Canada had the CME that took out part of, I think it was Quebec and all that. Yeah. So it is a, it is a localized thing that can, that doesn't affect the other side of the earth. Yeah. And you said there might be network effects. So if you have grids, which are of course, uh, sure. hardwired together over hundreds of miles might not yeah. be immediately impacted, but there might be, of course, uh, impacts down the line. Now that could create a pretty big global imbalance, you know, depending on which side of the planet it hits. And it could also, of course, lead to, uh, I would suspect that if there was somebody who wanted to make a move geostrategically, of course, that would be the time to do it. If your opponent had no power because of the sun hit them and it didn't hit you, right? (laughs) Sure. Yeah. Well, it's uh, something to think about. Derek asks, Dr. Bradley, would an EMP caused by a high altitude nuke or any EMP really cause our nuclear power plants to go down in the USA or anywhere? I guess. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, I will share, by the way, before I answer that, that, you know, Ukraine has nuclear power too. It's one of my concerns. I think they have 15 reactors in Ukraine. Yeah. And I know there are bands of civilians trying to protect those reactors. I think that's, that's a good thing because accident, they could accidentally cause damage to those reactors. I know Russia doesn't intentionally want to damage them. Because like you said, they want to have a piece of property that they can use, but, um, but that could happen by accident and could really pose a big problem for Europe. Um, but back to the question, uh, yeah, nuclear power plants can certainly be affected. I, I did an interview with a guy, he was a media relations guy from the Tennessee Valley Authority a few years back, because I had a bunch of questions like, how do you know when EMP is not going to destroy you and we're all going to, you know, we got 93 nuclear reactors in the United States, active reactors. How do you know we're not going to have 93 Chernobyls in the US if this occurs? And, and we spent about three hours talking through different scenarios. And uh, I wrote a paper on it. It's out on the web somewhere. If you search for my name in nuclear reactors, you probably find it. But basically, the short answer is that 
there are a number of different things to worry about. The reactor itself, um, the, the process will shut down, the fission process will shut down very, very fast. But with that, within a second, it will be over. They'll immediately shut off if a blackout occurs. So there's a dead man system that kicks in and stops the reaction. And that's all great, but it takes about three to five days for those rods in there to be cooled enough where they can open the reactor and get them out of there. All right. And that's with the cooling system functioning and all that. And there's all these methods by which they can keep cooling going, even without electricity. They can use their own energy, their own heat to keep the cooling systems running. So he was 100 percent sure they could kill the reaction, cool the reactor and get the rods out. That's sort of and, and I believed him. There was enough evidence there. And then they store them in these big boric acid demineralized pools, which if you want to imagine the giant swimming pool really deep where they stick these reactive rods in them, right? Hundreds of rods in there. And they leave them in there for years. Um, they have to cool. They're super heated and they're super radioactive. So they keep them in submerged in this water and they keep the water circulating in a cooling system for years, right? That's where the worry comes from is that what happens if you can't maintain electricity for three to five years and that water starts to boil off and you start to expose the rods. Well, then you get these explosions and you just, you know, spray radiation, radioactive particles, and you end up with a mess. Um, and, and he had arguments for that as well, which is that it's a multi-protected system. We have, you know, giant backup generators. Well, what if those fail? Well, then we got these ro rollout generators we can use to keep the pools cool. Well, what happens if those fail? Well, others would bring in secondary generators, you know, and well, what if all of that fails? You don't have infrastructure at all. What are you going to do? And he said, that's when they have the authority to flood the react, uh, flood the entire station, essentially. So a lot of them are built near something where they can, you know, release water, Fukushima, for example, they can release water into the area to flood it. And that's a worst case. But it was interesting because he said that they didn't need authority to do that. They possess the authority to do that themselves. So, and so if they were all to, all, if they were to flood that, wouldn't that just be sending the radiation into the oh, yeah. ocean? Yeah. yeah. But at least you're not getting the explosions and you're not spreading it in the air, you know, globally. Um, right. Yeah, you put radioactive contaminant into the ocean. Um, Fukushima did that, right? They had water come in and there was all these radioactive, you could detect radiation in fish and stuff for a period of time. Right. Um, so it's not an ideal thing, but it's better than the alternative of the explosion. So anyway, so the short answer is yes, there's some risk posed to nuclear uh, stations. I think if a CME or an EMP occurred. But I think there are a number of, you know, safeguards in place. Um, I'm not 100% convinced out of those 93 reactors, we wouldn't have one or more that had some serious issues. But I don't think it's probably the biggest danger we would face. I still think the loss of the electric grid would be felt in other ways that would be worse. Yeah, and it would take a, definitely a concerted effort on the government's part to ensure, and I'm sure they, mm -hmm. hopefully they have a contingency plan, but it's the government, so they probably don't, to deal with a situation like that when the diesel fuel runs out or whatever the case is, if sure. it's not a supply line in order to cool those spent fuel rods, uh, we could definitely have a very, very serious problem on our hands. And I always joke about how in these apocalyptic movies, you know, they, they never mentioned that, that, you know, all, yeah. all the nuclear power plants are melting down right now, but there yeah. was one movie that did. And I got, it was a bad movie, but they got that right. It was, there were zombies and everything. And yeah, there was radiation uh -huh. everywhere because there was all these nuclear power plants were, you know, boiling over. So anyways, uh, let's hope that that never happens. Cause that would be absolutely terrifying. The odds of a Carrington size event giving our enhanced geomagnetic system and weakening magnetic field. I'm not sure if that's a thing. Maybe you can uh, educate us on that. Are we more vulnerable than we've been in the past? Well, it is true that our Earth's magnetic field is changing. I think we might have talked about that last time about how it flips every so often on the Earth. And we have had a lot of movement with our North Pole. Um, but I don't know. I think the bigger issue is that we are now living in a modern industrialized society where everything's computerized and, you know, all of this stuff is very sensitive to electrical energy. Um, so if a, C if a large CME were to occur, like a Carrington event, well, which happened way back in 1859, if something like that occurred now, it would very likely have catastrophic consequences for the United States or anywhere wherever it affected in the world, just because we're so modernized with our electronics now. Um, how likely is it? Well, it's pretty darn likely, actually. Um, you know, statistically, you get a big CME that hits the Earth about every 150 years. So 
you can go back 150 years ago and that was 1860s or 1870s, right? Mm -hmm. So we're a little bit overdue for a, a really big CME to hit the earth. Um, and we're going to find out, and probably in my lifetime, what the effect of a large CME on the earth is, whether it does destroy part of the grid and we all wish we'd hardened it or whether it's not as big a deal as we thought it would be. Um, but I think statistically, we're just a little bit overdue for one. So probably we will see that before too long. All the more reason to have. And would your, I guess, your EMP device, would that detect that sort of wave? It does. Yeah, because this a CME essentially is just like the E3 of an EMP. It would slowly start to rise the voltages on the power lines. And the, the EMP alert would sound very early on and say, hey, the voltage levels are way getting out of spec here. You might want to disconnect from the grid. And that would be a great way to prevent that damaging energy from coming in. A related question I have, do you know of any, I remember I visited one in the past, but is there any good websites that track the current uh, solar activity and whether or not there's going to be? Yeah, there's a, there's a bunch of them. I can send them to you an email. I'll send you a few of them. Uh, they're hard to recite over the, the chat here, but I'll send you a few of them. Well, you can get real-time alerts. I, like, I get real-time alerts on my phone when there's a CME. Um, you know, We usually have a day or two days warning from when a CME hits you from when it first comes out. So it's nice to get those alerts and think, you know, mm, is that one serious enough to worry about? Um, so solar flares, we don't get much of a warning, but uh, CMEs, we do get enough time. If we want to do something, we can. And just for myself and others, what's the difference between a solar flare and a CME? Yeah. So a CME is like a big charged plasma. If you want to think about like, almost like you can think of like a, a fiery gas, right? This plasma that comes over the earth, this charged particles that come over the earth. Um, it's kind of like the sun burping out this big plasma. Um, a, a flare could be associated with a CME, but it's basically like a release of radio, radiation, right? High frequency radiation energy. And that has its own risks. But for us on Earth, because we're shielded on the Earth by our electromagnetic protection, you know, our, our, our magnetic field lines, we essentially are protected from those flares. We don't get radio, you know, radiation damage from it, unless you're at very high altitudes outside of the protection, like astronauts have to worry about solar flares because they can get that radiation damage. Um, and that those solar flares can certainly interfere with communications, radio systems. They can cause damage to satellites. I just recently, there was uh, some of Elon Musk satellites, I think were damaged by either a flare or a CME. So they can cause, they cause damage outside, you know, out of the bounds of the earth up at very high altitudes. Um, and they can affect us because we might not be able to communicate very well. But the big threat is if you get a CME is it now starts generating those currents at the Earth's surface. And that's what can cause lots of problems for us. Can you protect electronics in a turned off microwave? Yeah, you certainly can. Microwaves are pretty good at blocking RF energy. Um, I tested one for my EMP book. There's a little table of some data in there I took. Um, and the short answer is it does a pretty good job. If you have nothing else that you can store things in, yeah, stick them in an old microwave and close the door. And it might give you about, you know, 99% field reduction inside, which is pretty darn good. Um, it's not perfect. It's not as good as a well-built Faraday cage because it's not, it's not designed to block hundreds of megahertz. It's designed to block 2.4 gigahertz, which is what the microwave operates at. So it's not, it's not tuned quite to the right frequencies, but it's still pretty darn good. And so I always tell people, if you got nothing else and you got an old microwave, sure, you could certainly do that. It might not be a bad idea when you're leaving the house, you know, throw your little e-bag of emergency electronics in the microwave and, you know, it's kind of easy and practical. Okay, I have a aluminum trash cans made ready for an EMP event. I have strong metal Gorilla Tape that would seal the rim of trash cans. I'm almost sure this would save my electronics if and only if I had fair warning in advance. It seems to be the problem. I guess he's asking, will this work? And how do I manage something like that? So it is a common tactic to buy those big metal garbage cans and stick your electronics in them. And you can line them with cardboard if you want. That's fine. You don't want anything metal touching the, the metal of the can. Um, and then the, the question then becomes the lid, right? You have to put the lid on. And that little tiny seam around the lid ends up being pretty important. Some cans, man, they seal tight all the way around and they do fantastic. Other cans have a really thin gap. You may not even know it's there. And the energy just goes right up underneath it. It acts like a very efficient antenna. Um, and so there's two ways to solve that problem. You can either tape it with metal tape. So you can go to the hardware store and buy some aluminum duct tape for three bucks and tape it up. Um, the only trouble with that is, I know this firsthand because I did it for years. Every time you pull that tape off to get things out of it and then retape it, 
you know, you slice your fingers to no end. I just, you always think, oh, I won't slice myself this time. You always slice your fingers. It's just meant to cut you up. And so um, I did a bunch of research and found some gaskets, some little metal gaskets that go inside the lid of, of the trash can and they just stick in there. And then you can take the can off and on anytime you want. Um, they cost, you know, 30, 40 bucks, but it's, it saved my hand so much bleeding over the years. It's been well worth it. And that does a great job of sealing those cans up, those little conductive gaskets. Yeah, it seems a lot more practical if it's stuff that you want to assess on a regular basis, for sure. Okay, does a mobile home or a house with metal siding and a metal roof offer more protection from EMP than a wood home? Yeah, yeah, I would say it does. Um, not a huge difference. Maybe you get 10 dB or so. But again, 10 dB is 10 dB. You're reducing the field levels that are coming in through that metal. Um, of course, there's windows and doors and other things that are compromising what you're doing. But you do get some protection and it's better than sheetrock and it's better than brick. So yeah, I, I would say it does give you some protection. And when you say 10 dB, what is the optimal dB and what is dB? Yeah, so the, the military, if you go to the, the mill standard, um, you will find that it says 80 dB. 80 dB is 99.99% field reduction, which basically reduces an EMP down to ambient levels, all right? You don't really need that much because our electronics doesn't die every time, you know, there's a sudden lightning storm outside. We don't, everything doesn't die, right? So if you run the numbers, you need about 50 dB, which is 99.7% field reduction. Anything in 50 dB shielding almost certainly will survive. Maybe there's something in the world super sensitive that wouldn't, but most everything would survive. So that's the number I tell people to go for. Go for 50 dB. And if you should have confidence, whatever's in there is going to survive. And Metal trash cans that are properly sealed will provide much more than that, maybe 70 or 80 dB. Good Faraday cages made out of aluminum foil will give you 50 or 60 dB, so they're good enough. Uh, Faraday bags, you know, where you, you can put them in metalized bags and seal them up, those will give you at least 50 dB. So there's lots of ways to get that. Um, but that's the number I use is 50 dB. And that's just Art's number. Again, the military's number is, uh, is 80 dB. And dB stands for what? For decibel, it's, it's oh. just a ratio. Yeah, it's a mathematical ratio. Basically, for the for the mathies out there, you you take a log of the ratio, and then you take 20 times that when you're working with electric and magnetic fields, and you'll get a number. And that number tells you either how large something has got with respect to what was came in, or how small something got. And really, when we say 80 dB of shielding, we mean that the level is minus 80 dB down. It's so it's a negative 80 dB. Um, which is 99.99% of the signal has been eliminated. So it's just kind of a ratio of what came in versus what got through. Glenn Arthur asks, Hi Nate, my question to him would be, what are the best circuit breakers to protect your house? Yeah, I don't know that there are any circuit breakers um, that really protect your house any better than any others from an EMP or a CME because they're not designed to trip, you know, on certain conditions like that, but not that I'm aware of. Um, you're, you're probably fine with whatever breaker you have. It won't affect E1, E2 will happen before a breaker is ever going to do anything anyway. And the E3 really depends on someone throwing the breaker. It, it you know, somebody's got to throw it. It probably doesn't matter what breaker you have, as long as you're able to, to trip the breaker. This person says, stupid question. If someone Good. messes up our grid or internet or whatever, <laughs> an EMP, will they be able to see what's going on here? Not really sure what she meant by that. Yeah. Well, I guess the, the idea of that is if you took out the grid and then the internet fell because you don't have any power and all of that, would there be any way to get the information out, real-time information about what's happening? And I think the answer is, yeah, you'd lose a lot of ability to communicate because you wouldn't have the computerized system that you talked about earlier up and running. Um, but, you know, a foreign country would still have satellite technology. They could zoom in and see what's happening, what forces were moving where and what's going on. There would still be ham radios that people had protected. And, and some of the systems would still be functional. Not everything's going to go down. There'll be emergency systems that managed to survive. So I think there would be some information. But yes, you're right. We would lose some abilities to communicate uh, what was going on. And what about this one from Cole Peary? What would happen if an EMP nuke was detonated over Yellowstone supervolcano mm -hmm. since CMEs affect, and he's telling us here, that CMEs affect volcanic activity and earthquakes? Not sure if that's true. Let me let me know. Is that true? I don't know if that's true or not. I know there have been people who have looked at correlations between sun activity and earthquakes, for example. Uh, I don't know about volcano, but volcano is kind of an earth, you know, earthquake type activity. 
Um, maybe there is a correlation, and I don't know what it is. I don't think it's a strong correlation, though. Um, but his question did get me thinking. When I saw that question, I was like, holy, is there any way? I don't think an EMP detonated in its conventional way, way high in the atmosphere, and generates an EM wave would have any effect on something like a Yellowstone supervolcano. If it did, and I'm wrong, it'll be the last thing I'm wrong about. <laughs> you know, because if that volcano erupts, it's not just going to kill the people in that vicinity. It's going to destroy essentially civilization. So let's just hope that doesn't happen. Yeah, that'd be a double whammy of uh, ELE events. And that was actually the plot of the movie 2012, I believe. Yeah. Yeah, I was doing something freaky and triggered all the volcanoes to go off. Can you suggest a brand or model of a good surge protector for three phase incoming power, uh, uh -huh. typical EU grid power? Yeah, um, I often recommend for the US and Canada, the Siemens FS 140, 140, which is their first surge 140. I, I don't have any affiliation with Siemens, by the way, um, but I have that model on my home. Um, I looked at surge protectors oh, I guess about 15 different surge protectors a few years back and took them all apart and looked at all the components. And that was the one that was most impressive to me. Um, and those are great for US, but unfortunately in the Europe, Europe, they have different power level 230 or whatever, 232, 240. And so they don't have that model over there, but there are some others um, that are available, three phase surge protectors that are available for Europe. Um, if folks want to write me, they can, or maybe I can send you a link or something to a couple of those. I haven't taken them apart though. So it's difficult for me to say, like, I know Siemens has one, but there are other companies, Square D, I think, has one as well. Um, you can look at the ratings of those surge protectors and look for the, the max current surge on them. The, the FS140 that I recommend has a 140,000 amp you know, max surge capability. So you can look at that rating on those others and see where do they fall. You want one at least 100,000 amps uh, would be what I would say. And many of them have that. If you, they're a little more expensive for those three phase protectors. It might be a thousand dollars or something like that. But um, but look for that rating on there and uh, pick you know pick a reputable brand when you do that. Got a question? If I if waterproof something, include something that keeps the container dry, then toss my electronics into that, and then toss it into a lake or a pond. I think you kind of already answered this that it would protect it, but would it be yeah. practical? Is the question? Yeah. That it would protect it because, again, water is a great barrier for RF energy. So I think it would do a good job protecting if you could get it down at the bottom of a lake. Um, but again, I'm not sure, you know, there are things to bury at the bottom of the lake, maybe your gold stash or something. But I'm not sure your electronics would be the primary thing you would. There's other ways to stay, save it, I guess it be, might be a little easier. This question is, uh, what would the radiation levels be like after an EMP event? I'm presuming because we've detonated a nuke in the upper atmosphere would there be any radiation, ionizing radiation to worry about? Yeah, no, there wouldn't be. Um, if the nuke is up high enough when it detonates, you don't end up essentially causing these radioactive particles to, to go up into the air. So yes, you'd have giant electromagnetic waves, but you wouldn't end up with radiation, ionizing radiation that would cause people cellular damage. Tyler Goodwin, if you had to pick one actor to play Deputy U.S. Marshal Mason Raines, who would it be? Just trying to keep it light. So I wrote a book series called The Survivalist, right? It's a 12 book series and it follows a U.S. Marshal, Mason Raines is his name in the book, as he goes across the United States sort of setting things right that aren't that aren't going well. And it's a, it's a really fun series. I encourage if people like good adventure stories. It's a good adventure story. Um, and I always envision, you know, I took my my motivation from Justified. If anybody knows the, the TV show Justified with Timothy Oliphant. Uh, he was my image when I wrote that book about this U.S. Marshal. So, you know, if he were if he were to play Mason Reigns, that would be like the perfect fitting character. Um, kind of that cool eyed, you know, fast draw, you know, good, honest guy. That was kind of who I was um, modeling it after. OK, I could see it like a young Clint Eastwood or something like that. Yeah. Oh, I loved Clint Eastwood as a kid, too. That was I love the old Westerns. He'd be cool in an apocalypse movie, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I Somebody he, send him a note. <laughs> Tell him to get on this. I hope he does it before uh, he parts ways with us. What effect would an EMP have on a person with an implant such as a heart or spinal cord simulator? It's a hard thing to answer definitively. So I don't want to say yes or no. Um, the good news is those devices are meant to withstand high levels of electromagnetic fields. They design them that way um, because they don't want people to have you know, problems when they get near some electromagnetic source. 
Um, no one that I know of has ever tested them versus an EMP. I did a little analysis based on one particular model uh, of a pacemaker, and it looked like it would survive an EMP just from my, my back of the napkin analysis. But I guess the, you know, each device is different and how they're done, you know, there's several different types of devices as well. Um, so I wouldn't want to draw any firm conclusions that they would survive. Um, but I also wouldn't want everybody to think, oh, if I have this implant of some sort, I'm de definitely dead. It's going to kill me because they're really meant to survive um, that kind of, you know, at least strong electromagnetic energy. So there's a good chance that maybe it gets reset, but then it's able to be recovered. Um, so I, I don't know the right answer, but I think there's a chance it would survive. And with the fact that it's in your body, I, I don't know what the DB of the body, if there's any DB. And then of course, you know, you're, you're assuming there's other layers in between mm -hmm. you and the pulse, would that have any attenuating effect? Yeah. Yeah, it does. It certainly, your body's kind of like a giant water bag in a sense, right? It's a little denser than that even. So you're going to get some attenuation. The trouble is, you know, there's wires that come out of those things to stimulate the heart and all that. And so the wires act as antennas. It's, it really have to be a very careful analysis done to understand the susceptibility of it. Um, so I'm just reluctant to draw a firm conclusion about it. And uh, I, I guess that's probably the end of our questions for the most part. But, you know, with respect to what's going on in the world right now, and all things EMP aside, is there anything you're doing right now differently? Are you, are you at a higher DEF CON level? Um, perhaps you can talk about if there's been any changes. I know you, you probably have NDAs. You can't tell us everything, but has there been any changes uh, in NASA as a result of what's going on? Uh, maybe just ta yeah. talk a bit about what your own preparedness strategy is at this point in the game. Yeah, so I'm on a little heightened scale of alert here myself personally. I think the situation in Europe is very concerning. I think it's not anything like we've had in my lifetime. So it's worth watching for sure. Um, the US, I think, could suffer some things like cyber attacks. That would be a, a very reasonable thing we could have a ha hit us, which could limit our access to money, maybe our access to food. Um, I don't think we're about to be you know, nuked. I could be wrong, but I don't think so or invaded or something like that. But I do think we're at a heightened threat right now. There are things that could happen to us that would affect us. Um, so we should be better prepared. We should make sure that our preparations are solid and in order. You know, we've thought about food and water and backup power and whatever other things you need to make do if your world were to be disrupted for a period of time that you're gonna, you're gonna be all right. So I do encourage people, you know, if you're kind of a halfway prepper, get serious for this immediate time because there is a threat that could affect you and could it definitely affect us in a way we don't want it to. So I'm, I'm up a level. Yeah, me too. And it's definitely making me want to expedite my off grid plans. Cause I do have plans mm -hmm. to uh, buy some land off the grid and, you know, start a bit of a homestead. And I do think that this is going to be, I get the suspicion that it's going to be more protracted than people think. And it could go on for a long time, uh, or at least the, the repercussions of it. Hopefully it doesn't, you know, I mean, whether it's swift or not, is that going to result in more or less suffering? I don't know, but I have a, a sneaking suspicion that these new East first West tensions now have been rekindled in a way, which is not uh, going to be settled for a long time. And for that reason, that just adds to the other basket of reasons that I need to, really ramp up my preparedness and really try to uh, position myself to be more self-reliant in the future. You know, I always say there's three kinds of preppers. There's micro, meso, and macro preppers. Micro is kind of like the guy with a bug out bag who, you know, just has a plan to kind of bug out. Uh, the meso is the person who has a plan to bug in and they, they're like stores of energy. Cause I consider preps like food, ammo, all that stuff. It's just energy. You know, we put energy into freeze drying that food or energy into making that bullet. And then the, the macro prepper is the, the one I think we all, well, some of us anyways, aspire to be, which is the person who can actually generate their own energy, whether that by solar panels, uh, you know, growing food, you know, being able to produce stuff. So my whole strategy is to move towards being more of a macro prepper. I know you yourself, you're kind of a, a meso prepper. Of course, you, you know, you have a job where you, you have to, you know, you can't be out in the middle of nowhere, but is that something you've considered is, you know, going a little bit more off the grid? 
Yeah, I've considered it. It, it. My family, unfortunately, doesn't really allow that move quite there. I'm, I'm just like you. I would love to have a piece of property be completely self-reliant. Um, maybe one day I'll get there. When you have all these other responsibilities of children in college and you know, jobs and other things, it's really difficult to make that um, transition to that point. Um, so you're right. I'm in the middle. We have lots of preparations and we'd be much better prepared than most people, but we're not quite, you know, out in the cabin where we have our retreat we could get to and we'd be fully self-reliant. Yeah. Well, I guess having a cabin is, is a great thing in itself because it's a practical bug out location for a lot of people for sure. Well, I want to thank you for coming on once again. And, you know, we'll see if you guys have more questions for Dr. Bradley, please post them in the comment section below and maybe he'll come back for a second encore. How does that sound? Yeah, sounds great. I'm happy to do it. And if nothing else, I'll come back and we can blow something up with an EMP at some point. That would be absolutely fantastic. Maybe if you're ever up in Canada, you know, bring your EMP machine. I'm not sure they'll let you bring it through customs, but yeah, maybe not. I don't know. You, you're in, you're a NASA guy. You got to have a little bit of pull. Yeah, I don't think so, but I don't think so. All right. Well, we'll talk about maybe ways that we can circumvent the any legal hurdles that we might encounter in doing something like this. Because I'm really curious about talking to somebody there's got to be a university lab or somewhere that would mm -hmm. let us do something like this because i bet it's it would be really important for people to, to visually experience and and to see something to see the actual power of an emp because i don't think a lot of people have seen that but i would encourage people to go and check out your channel and if you want to pick up one of the detection devices, is it still in like a crowdfunding phase or is it already in production? Yeah, you know, it's a pre-order phase. It's not crowdfunding, but you can pre-order them at disasterprepare.com. Um, essentially, we're at the, the final prototype phase. They'll be in production within probably a month or so, um, probably ship with them around in May or something like that. Okay, well, hopefully we don't need them before yeah. then. I, I agree. <laughs> Yeah, the way things are going. But hey, thanks a lot for coming out and uh, look forward to talk talking with you more in the future. All right. Great. Thanks for having me again. Take care.